Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, food loss and waste advisor and producer of The Kitchen Sink. Today, I will be speaking with Amanda Brondi, Vice President of International Projects at the Global Cold Chain Alliance, or GCCA. Together, we will discuss the role of climate smart cold chain in reducing food loss and waste, the opportunities that exist for cold chain development in emerging countries, and the collaboration that can exist between cold chain companies and food banks. Welcome, Amanda. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Nika. So like you said, my name is Amanda Brondi. I'm Vice President of International Projects at the Global Cold Chain Alliance, or GCCA. And if anyone is not familiar with that organization, we are the trade association for the temperature-controlled logistics industries. We're a membership organization, so we have uh, refrigerated warehouse companies, refrigerated transportation companies, design, build, and construction companies, and then suppliers, which are the groups who make and manufacture all of the necessary parts uh, that one would need to successfully run a cold chain business. So in my role, I oversee our international development projects, and then I also uh, helped initiate and manage our food loss and waste initiative. Excellent. Thanks, Amanda. I'm really excited to, to speak with you today, and I know GCCA has a great network, so I'm excited to learn more about that. So let's let's start it off um, by having you tell us more about the work that GCCA does and how it relates to reducing food loss and waste. Sure. So the GCCA work on food loss and waste actually is in two areas, and it's the, the two areas that I work in, the projects and our new initiative. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're a membership organization. Uh, we are in more than 90 countries, and we have around 1,500 member companies. Approximately 15% of those are in North America, and then the rest of them are kind of sprinkled throughout the world. We began our projects about 20 years ago, and it was... Uh, an effort for us to help grow the cold chain in areas where we don't have a strong membership base, where we're not doing daily activities and providing training and things like that. We run them through our foundation, which is called the Global Cold Chain Foundation. We're actually in the process of the name change. It was formerly the World Food Logistics Organization or WFLO. Some people called us WIFLO, which I never got behind, but in any case, we are uh, probably by the end of the year, 100% going to be the GCCF. And if you look on our website, that's what you'll see. But we started those projects through our foundation as a way for members to share their experience, to help, again, you know, grow the cold chain in those areas, to share their lessons learned from, from individuals who have successfully owned and operated cold chains and encountered challenges. Uh, we do support projects through a variety of different ways. Uh, it can be you know, infrastructure development through market studies or feasibility studies, advisory services. Probably the area that we're strongest is in our training programs, which is practical training. So not academic, but we use our members as our experts. And so you get real business to business, uh, how to operate day to day, what are those challenges and considerations that you might want to take. So that's the first area. The second area is an internal initiative that we started and we began this around uh, 2021, and it was in December so that, uh, if you remember the headlines back then, uh, they're actually not so different than they are today, but it was, you know, food insecurity was on the rise, inflation was uh, really bad, supply chain disruptions were occurring, and the war in Ukraine hadn't started, but it was kind of on the horizon. So we were just literally brainstorming, seeing all of this, like, what could we do as an association to try to make a difference. And so we started off by doing a small scale needs assessment where we met with food rescue groups, so a lot of food banks, and we met with our members as well, those who have been supporting uh, communities in their in, or organizations within their communities. And we created something of like a Venn diagram identifying the 
the needs that occur or that exist within those groups, what are the GCCA resources that might help solve some of their challenges? And then we kind of look for that piece in the middle, those overlapping areas. And we use that as a way to come up with recommendations. So at the time we formed 15 recommendations and I think that's grown to like 22 now because we keep adding, it's, it's a living document. So it gets updated all the time. But we kicked it off in 2022, this proper kind of initiative. And the first step we took was opening up a, a free membership type for food, like food rescue groups. So it could be food banks. It could be any group that serves to redistribute food to keep it out of the landfill and into, into the hopefully the mouths of hungry people. Um, at the moment, we have about 40 uh, food rescue members. Uh, we partnered with Feeding America and Global Food Banking Network as a way to kind of promote that effort. And uh, we're just going to see kind of where it goes from here. We've got other things that we're going to do, but right now it's not even a year old. So every day we're just kind of figuring out what we can do to help grow that. Excellent. Thank you for sharing those insights um, on the, the rich and diverse work that GCCA does. Uh, really interesting to hear about uh, the capacity building that you do. Really appreciate that business to business learning um, and excited to learn more about this initiative and your work with with food rescue. And I know you mentioned uh, your partners are both domestic and international. So I'd like to um, kind of zoom out and talk about the importance of investing in climate smart cold chain in emerging countries. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, so I started at GCCA in 2015, and at the time, there was really minimal attention paid to cold chain or, or post-harvest management. I, I would read food systems reports for regions or for countries, and it was always listed as kind of a bullet point in a series of recommendations, like cold chain infrastructure, and that was kind of where it stopped. Uh, recently, we've seen a big shift towards more focus on actual infrastructure investment, training on best practices. And a lot of that was, you know, sadly due to COVID. But at the same time, you know, why is it important? I mean, cold chain is a solution to, you know, reducing food loss and waste. But at the same time, you want to ensure that the benefits that you reap from doing that are complemented by the benefits that can come from actually investing in climate smart cold chain. Uh, I will say there's a lot of exciting innovations out there. There's so many solutions, whether it's from solar storage, uh, you know, painting or coating to help reduce heat load, phase change material, uh, use of, use of uh, renewable resources. There's a lot that exists. Um, I think the, the challenge that's in front of us now is helping the companies that have innovated in these areas to scale up. And that could just be sharing information, you know, getting it into the hands of private sector investors, but it could also help on the development side. I think there's a space for projects to help demonstrate technology and provide a use case for that. Um, there is actually, the IFC runs a, a pretty uh, exciting program called Tech Emerge, which helps to partner new innovative solutions with private sector so that they actually do generate these kind of use cases. Um, so yeah, I think what, there's a lot of room for growth on the the kind of climate smart innovation side. And the benefit is that a lot of the countries where they're implementing or, you know, beginning their cold chain can kind of leapfrog over some of the, some of the way it developed, let's say like in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere. Thank you for that response. Um, I, I know you mentioned there's, there's a lot of exciting um, new technologies out there and, and hopefully we'll have some episodes following this to to explore some of those innovative solutions to to cold chain. I want to circle back to something you mentioned previously, which is the work that you're doing with food rescue and food donation. So I'm, I'm really interested to hear from you the opportunities for collaboration between cold chain companies and food banks. And can you share the work that GCCA is doing in this space? Yes, and uh, this is my favorite topic, I think, at the moment. So I will preface everything by saying that the work that we are doing at GCCA has been inspired by our members 100%. In 2021, my colleague Lizelle, who is the director of our South Africa office, she authored an article talking about how members in Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa were supporting and collaborating with their local food banks. One of our board members supported the startup of a food bank in Panama. And then even here in the United States, we had one of our members in the Midwest that during COVID, they actually stepped in and ran the entire food bank for three days 
because virtually all of the food banking staff and volunteers had come down with COVID. And so everything that we've been trying to do is not meant to kind of take the place of any of those activities, but more we're trying to set up a launching pad where we can kind of scale that up, uh, do more. Many of our members do this work, but they don't all. And there's definitely plenty of areas for kind of overlapping collaboration where we can just kind of do more and do better. So I had mentioned the needs assessment that we did and all those recommendations that came up. So those kind of fall into three broad buckets of, of areas that we're tackling. The first was genuinely just to increase the the ability for food rescue groups to access GCCA's network of members, our resources, our scientific advisors, training programs, supplier companies, anything that can make a difference. Uh, the WFLO began in 1943. And so we've amassed, you know, a lot of best practices, commodity storage information, Basically, you name it, we've probably looked at it. And so we're hoping that this will be kind of an entry point for food rescue groups so they don't have to kind of reinvent the wheel. They have easy access. In all cases, our members might not be able to help them. They might have, you know, they might be full on storage space if storage space is needed, but at least it gives them a quick uh, outreach that they can do to say, you know, does this facility in this location have space for me? And at the end of the day, if we make a connection, then that food bank has, or that food rescue group has that connection in the future. The second area that we're working on is solving the challenges for our members. So our members don't own the product, but you know, if a load gets rejected for any reason and they have the customer's permission to donate that, there are still challenges that sit in the way. And we're kind of trying to do what we can to alleviate some of those challenges. And that might be working through our advocacy program. It might be just connecting them with some of the food rescue members that have joined because in a lot of cases, those groups, uh, FarmLink is an example, they're solutions for our members. You know, they can help get that product from this, you know, truck over to where it needs to be. The third area where kind of the recommendations fell, that third bucket is, it's just beating the drum on food loss and waste. Um, I have a tendency, I don't know about you, Nika, but I kind of assume that when I walk into a room, most people know what I know when it comes to this issue, that they're hearing the same things and they're reading the same articles, but this is what I do for a living. And so of course I'm reading up on it more than your average person. And the same goes for our members. So we've incorporated food loss and waste sessions into GCCA events and are just trying to encourage them to pay more attention to this idea that food loss and waste is a huge issue. Food insecurity is a problem everywhere, even in the United States. And hopefully by having more information about that and then also hearing about some of the stories that their competitors, you know, other members are doing within their community might inspire them to also uh, see what they can do. And so I think it's just an idea for us to help kind of grow this initiative. There is definitely going to be more that comes out of this. Uh, I, I've talked with Unica before, and I have talked with a few of our members about the potential for food banks to partner or serve as an anchor customer for some of the cold, ch uh, cold chain infrastructure that's happening. And locations like in Africa with some of those members that are doing good work with the food banks. I think there's a lot of potential for there to be increased collaboration and recognition of the fact that food banks are a part of the food system. There will always be food loss or food waste that occurs. And it's just more a sense of how we respond to that than kind of leaving them out of the entire picture. So. Like you said, I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities for synergies there. And I really appreciate you you raising this point of um, raising awareness of food loss and waste. Obviously, that's one of the goals of, of this podcast, because like you said, not everyone is um, nerding out on food loss and waste to the extent that we are. But at the same time, they could be um, taking steps, whether that's improving food safety or trying to improve efficiency within their business that could also help reduce food loss and waste. And I think the more that we raise awareness of those strategies and those the innovations that are out there, um, a lot of them make good business sense for these companies because they're saving money by not wasting food. So I, I really appreciate you speaking with us today and sharing some of the work that GCCA is doing to increase access to the great information that is out there that you've collected on Cold Chain, um, making those connections with your excellent network and reducing those barriers to, to food donation for your partners. I'm really excited to see 
the work that comes out of this. And I'm really excited to continue the conversation with you about the, the synergies between cold chain and, and food donation and food recovery. So thank you, Amanda, for joining us today. Great. Thank you, Nika. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition.